let's uh, move on to uh, maybe uh, to a crisis that that affects uh, Europe at the moment the most, uh, the Middle East. Uh, and what kind of possibilities do the uh, civil organizations have there? So, yes, sir, please, the floor is yours. I don't think I have a good answer for you. So I think uh, uh, it's always uh, business as usual in the Middle East, uh, conflicts uh, everywhere. But... Uh, Actually, I was thinking uh, about, uh, you know, how to address the questions that you basically uh, uh, listed for uh, our interventions. And I was thinking uh, that the best way is basically to avoid uh, being hypothetical and, uh, and theoretical and just go into, you know, practical uh, uh, discussion. Since, you know, the conflicts that we are enduring uh, right now in the region are uh, still in progress, so uh, it is very difficult to evaluate the situation as things are always changing, uh, sometimes at a daily basis. So uh, thinking of the common factors for, uh, as addressed as a question uh, at a play in, in uh, political uh, transitions, uh, I was uh, interested also in a point mentioned by uh, uh, by Jock on his uh, comment on uh, Dr. Deng's uh, presentation regarding the weak institutions, because it's something that we've always, uh, you know, uh, here in the in the region, the you know this concept of uh, and this term of weak and fragile states and uh, and uh, so on and so forth and. I happen to think uh, quite the opposite, actually, because I don't think in many, yeah, of course, there are definitely certain cases of fragile states in the region, uh, which are the usual suspects, be it in uh, the Palestinian territories, uh, the West Bank, and uh, now, of course, in, in a country like Syria, in a country like Iraq, but in the rest of the region, uh, we actually suffer from strong institutions and uh, very not fragile institutions. What we came to uh, call in the uh, Arab uh, Spring uh, era uh, the deep state. So it is uh, basically, I think, a very important dynamic that uh, we can witness now that the strong deep state is falling apart somehow. However, it is very important to balance and manage this deconstruction of this deep state in order not to end up into chaotic situation as we uh, did already in, in Libya or in, in Syria or in Yemen. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, the three countries are uh, enduring uh, civil war and uh, acute and harsh bloody civil war. Uh, uh, and also at the same time, we don't uh, want to get into the uh, another possible uh, result of uh, deconstructing the so-called deep state, which is the counter-revolution, as we uh, witnessed uh, uh, the developments in the last couple of years in Egypt. So basically, uh, uh, so far, uh, you know, uh, we still look at Tunis as a country that has managed mostly to get a smooth uh, transition, relatively speaking smooth, uh, in comparison to other cases in the region, a smooth transition into a democratic uh, uh, or democratically based political system. So uh, from that uh, sense, uh, I believe that uh, I would argue that in a nutshell, uh, the problem is basically uh, the uh, phenomena of the strong deep state rather than weak institutions. Uh, now moving into the, uh, the political dynamics, I think I would, just as my colleague Jock said, focus on business as a non-traditional uh, sector, I would focus on the very classical and traditional sector, and that is the civil society. 
Not that, uh, you know, it is something new for us in the region. Of course, it has been always uh, mentioned and discussed and has always highlighted, you know, all stakeholders, the importance of the involvement and engagement of civil society organizations, yet had always been kept at the uh, hypothetical abstract uh, theoretical level rather than to be basically part and parcel of the uh, political process and the political system. Uh, uh, I don't want to dwell on how important it is to include the civil society organizations. Uh, however, because I think it goes without saying that, you know, uh, we really need to balance the formula of governance in the region in different countries in a way that would basically uh, allow uh, the so-called participatory governance to flourish and uh, expand and or be applied in, in general. Uh, but the problem is uh, uh, after the so-called Arab Spring, people real actually I wrote something now and based on the comments, <laughs> you know, I decided to put the my intervention aside and try to basically focus on whatever was I was stimulated by my, my colleagues' interventions. So after the so-called Arab Spring, we realized that, you know, okay, we have been always calling for a bigger role for the civil society organizations. But what civil society organizations? And are they really civil? And are they societal? And are they representative of of the so-called society at large. And uh, apparently uh, the, the question uh, came to cross our minds after what we have witnessed and seen uh, at the beginning of the so-called Arab revolutions in countries like Tunis or Egypt or even Yemen, that you know, all the so-called civil society organizations that have been uh, you know, uh, existing for the last 20 years, two decades, and uh, donors have invested millions and millions of dollars and euros on these so-called CSOs and uh, uh, CSO activists had no role whatsoever in bringing on change in the in these countries. Not saying because they were basically collaborating or against that change, but because really they ended up you know, disconnected with the real uh, people in the sense here, real, the normal uh, laymen, uh, the, the so-called the streets. And uh, this, uh, this connection is basically a, a result of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, for two decades, these civil society organizations, uh, members and donors, uh, have ended up, uh, you know, existing within their own bubbles and uh, ended up uh, really not touching base with what are the problems and the needs of the people of their own societies. So they adopted agendas that were, was basically, were basically addressing, uh, uh, you know, Western uh, democracies uh, thinking. Uh, I'm not saying that in the sense of you know, uh, conspiracies, etc., and so on and so forth, as much as, you know, uh, they were cutting and pasting agendas based on whatever the donors were thinking, rather than adopting and advocating agendas that really reflect the needs of their societies. So I think that was seriously a problem that, unfortunately, until now, we don't see uh, international actors addressing. And this is where, for me, as a, an analyst and independent consultant, I noticed that uh, you know uh, countries like Finland could be uh, uh, in a better position uh, to uh, intervene, even humbly and modestly, because of the fact that they don't have this baggage that other countries could have, like Germany, like France, like Britain, with all due respect to all these countries. I'm not saying that uh, because I want to sound more royal than the king and more Catholic than the Pope, but because in reality, I noticed after working now for more than five years with CMI, when, uh, at a regional level, in all countries that we've been there, whether be it in Morocco, Tunis, Libya, Egypt, 
let alone, of course, Sudan and South Sudan, in Yemen, Iraq, and uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine, and very recently in the Gulf, which is very tough, tough you know, to basically uh, accept interaction with NGOs, international NGOs, especially in a city like Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. They see that, you know, we really need international intervention that addresses, you know, the, the realities uh, of the region, but still that has no baggages, you know, that would make it more difficult for us to handle because, uh, you know, it will become more political and uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, more like engaging in the process for the sake of process rather than for the sake of proper uh, uh, end results that could, uh, you know, benefit the, the, the society. Therefore, uh, uh, you know, CMI in that sense, uh, we're very uh, fortunate to basically uh, have a very humble and, and uh, you know, uh, straightforward approach in a serious conflicts in Iraq, in, 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 in Yemen, and in Libya. Uh, that basically uh, reflected upon what people right now do need or do think. And when we say people, uh, you know, even those who do not even speak English, because it's, it's a very, uh, very important phenomena in the region that, uh, you know, whenever you go to the region, you end up talking to those who are working with those who speak English. And unfortunately, by that, you are missing a lot by not contacting people who don't speak English, yet do have very interesting and very important, uh, you know, uh, contribution to any process that could lead into uh, reconciliation or, uh, or stability. But for the fact of not willing to invest in such a tiny logistical, you know, cost, you could end up uh, missing such a, a, a very big proportionate uh, a contribution coming from a very important sector. And here we're not talking about one country, be it Jordan or Egypt, we're talking about 22 countries. After all, they're still considered as uh, one big chunk of an Arab entity with definitely different nuances and discrepancies, but still, for somehow identically, they still uh, consider that they have more commonalities uh, than discrepancies, which basically uh, uh, make us, you know, forced to think that we could have at least a kind of a one strategic approach to the region. And the conclusion of my point is that as long as international organizations, be it donors, governments, or even think tanks and NGOs, as long as they do not invest more in their own building their own capacities to understand, better understand the societies that they are dealing with, you know, and I'm not saying that is an easy task, you know. It is one thing to deal with a country like South Sudan, you know, you could, you could spend, invest some time and, and become an expert, but when it comes to a whole region like the Arab world, you know, you, you, you are confused where to start with, you know? and if you focus on Egypt, you would not definitely be someone who could understand Syria, and so on and so forth. So therefore, I'm not saying it is easy, but at least it is time that we really touch and knock on the right doors, rather than just, you know, uh, uh, wasting our efforts and energy and resources, just for the sake of avoiding uh, having a serious guilt trip, you know, uh, it, it requires more than that. And and CSOs definitely are still very important and very uh, uh, useful, instrumental actor in in the polity of the region, uh, but uh, it requires a different approach than what we have used to. And maybe in the discussion, I could uh, touch upon. Uh, certain experiences that we have had at CMI in our projects in Yemen or in, in Iraq or in, in Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and, and Egypt, and Libya, and Tunis. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A lot of interesting points. So um, are there any thoughts or comments from Joko, Dr. Lual in the beginning? No, I think
think let us listen first to. I would prefer to listen to the floor and then come back. All oh, right. Oh, <coughs> A very small comment. I, I think that you're absolutely right about uh, very often donors driving the agendas of civil society organizations to match the agenda of donors and not of the community they should actually be serving and working with. And in, uh, we see it in Ukraine as well. And they, it, you end up with a, a, less than, uh, a less than effective response because it's not really serving the interests interest of the, the citizens. It's serving the interests of the donor by ticking the donor's boxes. And you often see programs not being red-lighted by donors because that are actually right for citizens. And instead, you see programs red-lighted, green-lighted by the donor that's right for the donor. And that, of course, is exactly what you're saying. And that, that's wrong. And I'm sure that it's interesting to hear you saying it's happening in the Middle East. And I certainly see it um, happening frequently in Ukraine. May I just... Uh this is, I'm not trying to uh, engage in a blame game here and trying to suggest that all oh, these arrogant donors, uh, actually, you know, we've been dealing with them for the last almost 15 years, and we know that they are genuine about really helping and supporting. The thing is that, you know, uh, uh, they expect the local stakeholders to get back and correct them. And the problem is, this is why I say we need to knock on the right door, that these the local stakeholders are uh, simply looking at this as an industry. You know, it, it has become an industry. It's a business. So uh, I know that this is the song that you would like to listen to, so I'm going to play this song for you. And the donor, the poor donor, comes thinking that this guy is very genuine, and then I would need to support him. And after one project, they start to build a kind of uh, a, a, a relationship of trust and, uh, and confidence and also convenience. So they feel it much easier to invest in, you know, this guy, even though they are not, he is not the right guy, but as long as he is legally and financially okay, meaning he's not corrupt, fine. At least the money in the pipeline is being spent and I don't have to face certain questions from my bosses back home. So it's not a blame game as much as the dynamics have to basically be addressed in a way that, uh, you know, would bring on change. And this is also, in my opinion, a very important factor uh, uh, that we need to look into when we talk about political and economic dynamics in, in, in conflicts.